So with cattle, you could take cattle and you could catch them up in what's called a squeeze chute. You run them in. Oh yeah, she'll dig to China if we'll oh, let her. Yeah. yeah. Like it. Uh, I had a guy told me to cut the nose off, the tip of the nose off with a pocket knife to keep them from rooting. Aaron is not gonna raise pigs if I'm gonna have to even consider doing any of those things. This is a grinder mixer. Um, this is uh, a piece of equipment that allows us to make our feed here on the farm. We've got a few different things. I'll show you guys. We'll walk around this a little bit. What we've got down here is our onloading auger. So it's got a hopper at the bottom of it. We take our product and we pour in there. It's got an auger that lifts it up into this opening here. I'm gonna walk around if you guys wanna swing your head over here. The product actually goes from that hopper into this. These hammers here actually take and beat the product down to a particle size that it can fall through the screen. So then it goes into this. This is just a huge mixer, right? You can make quite a big biscuit in this thing, right? Um, as it mixes up, we pour our minerals, we pour any of the product in here. And so what that really does is that allows us to have full control over the ration. A lot of uh, the feed that we used to buy is what's called least cost formulation is how they would do that. There'd be a guaranteed analysis on it, but it didn't necessarily mean that you would always get the same product. And our focus is, uh, you heard me, the very first thing that I talked about with the four focuses that we have were the human health and the quality of the product. So I could tell you all day about you know, what we're doing for the environment and our community and how well we treat our animals. But if I provide you with a steak or a pork chop or an egg, that's just horrible quality. It's easy for a consumer at that point because of the cost difference to go find a happy medium of what they feel like may be something there. So we have to provide people with a quality product. That's one of the biggest reasons that we took a step in this direction. It's more financially viable for us, but also just knowing that we have full control. We have eight different rations that we feed to our, our swine program. Uh, two of those are for either a gestating or a lactating sow or a boar, um, which would be an, a gestation feed. Even though they don't gestate, they still gotta eat something. And then we have three grower and three finisher rations that we make here on the farm. And so it just gives us full control over that. This thing will be hooked to the tractor just like it is now. After it's mixed up, we take it and we offload it straight into feeders that hold about a ton of piece in this. And so, yeah, it makes our life a lot easier. When we started doing this up in Saluda on our family's land, um, we 55 gallon bucketed it into, uh, into those feeders. And so it's easy to decide to spend some money on something like this after you've done it a few times. But Source and feed locally is a big thing that we like too. And that's one of the things that we're hoping to be able to do within the next two years is, is um, part of our goal to be able to grow at least about 25 to 30% of our feed. And over the next five to six years, hopefully transition to where we're able to grow all of our own feed. And at that point, right now we're sourcing a conventional grain. We're hoping to be able to grow a non-GMO product. And hopefully eventually, um, I would love to, to see consumer focus and, and their priorities shift enough that they're willing to spend enough on organic and then we would have enough scale to be able to do that. That's what I'd like to see. I'm not sure if I'll see that. I hope my son does though. So the, the biggest thing economically, again, that it allows us to do, I feel like is the quality by being able to say, hey, we're always gonna have a consistent product. And why that's important economically uh, is because as we present a product to a retail customer or a chef, they're gonna want consistency. So even if it costs us a little bit more, it can help us to either uh, recruit or retain a, a customer. Um, the other thing too is, it is especially important over the last, you know, depending on the, on the research that you look at, maybe 120 days, 60, 90, 120 days, especially the last 30 days of what the animal consumes for pork quality. And we're able to take things that may not, may be more economically viable when they're younger to feed that may not quite be as expensive. The other thing though, is that an animal lead, needs less protein on the finish end than it does on the grower end. So when we look, we have a stage one, stage two, and a stage three grower feed. The stage one feed is gonna to be to an animal that was just weaned off of its mother. And so that animal is gonna be seven to eight weeks old, and it's gonna need a higher crude protein level than an animal that is close to harvest weight. They are of a mature frame size, and they need more energy in their diet. So that's one of the things too, that if we are only feeding one ration like we used to do when we bought the ration from you know, a, a distributor, when we only fed one ration, we may be feeding 
a ration that's great for like that stage three animal. It's a middle of the road protein. It's not high protein, it's not low protein. So it's only really meeting the sweet spot with one group of animals as opposed to, you know, you're still feeding finished animals too high of a protein level and smaller animals not high enough. So giving us full control over that, it makes it to where you are spending the money to give them the ration that they need. And that helps economically to capitalize on what they're actually going to ingest and how they're gonna grow and perform. By us making the feed here, we're able to cut out the, the feed mill, right. the middleman there. Right. So we go directly to the growers, buy the feed from them, yep. and then we're able to bring it here. And so it cuts out a couple different steps, yeah. Uh, so the question was um, feeding slop or other byproducts and things. And we don't feed any slop. There's nothing that we would feed our animals that we wouldn't consume, if that makes sense. Other than you know, we can't eat pig feed. We can't, you know, you can't eat filled corn. When I first got into this, I had somebody that said, man, feed your pigs for free, take five gallon buckets to all the restaurants, have them scrape all the table scraps off of it, and then just go feed that to your pigs. And I was like, I don't think we're on the same page here. I think there's a little gap of, you know, a difference of understanding there. So, um, no, we don't, we're pretty intentional with it. And in, and from our experience, I think it's, it's paying off. We're learning more every day. I think it's paying off because we do get a lot of feedback about consistency and quality of product. And so while we may be spending more on the feed that we're giving them, we see healthy animals because it is a well-balanced diet and it gives them the nutrients that they need. The minerals that we use really help with nutrient utilization in the feed. And so because of that, you know, again, we spend more, but we have healthier animals, I feel like, in a, in a higher quality product than we had had before. We had, North Carolina State University offers a lot of information on that. I, I don't know those, um, those numbers as far as crude protein level. And in my mind, I would imagine, depending on what the actual, what the, the products were used to make the, the beer at the brewery, I would imagine that you would have some variance in nutritive value with that. Um, but I don't know what those are. I, I think that the research that I've seen is you can feed a certain percentage of that in the diet um, without it necessarily having negative ramification on taste or texture. Um, and it can serve as a good supplement. The problem that we've seen with that too is we've talked to some larger breweries. We talked with like Sierra Nevada and a few different places around and it's just the volume. Um, we wouldn't be able to go through that amount of volume. Spoilage too, yeah. I would be interested to see how it could be used as a fertilizer, honestly. Um, I, I, I say that because we we got some, we weren't able to use it quick enough. This has been probably six years ago and we were just getting little plastic like Rubbermaid totes um, from a microbrewery. We took that stuff and I ended up uh, it kind of got a funky smell to it, so I poured it out on the pasture, and when I did, I came back and it looked like you had spread a, nitrogen, a synthetic nitrogen. It was, it, was, it was quite impressive of what we had put out there. So I would be interested to see what, how it could be used, and that may, it may not lead to anything. I would be interested to see if people are, or if it could be used as a fertilizer source. Can I have a comment on that too? Please, yeah. Yeah, um, one other thing about spent grain is a lot of people make don't make the distinction between distiller's grain and brewer's grain because those are two different things. Distiller's grain comes from ethanol production which you find most in the Midwest whereas in uh, brewer's grain aka spent grain you find from like microbreweries and stuff. So when you look at the nutritional facts for spent grain a lot of people say oh well it's 29 percent crude protein that's great that's awesome. Well that's not completely accurate and by accurate I mean that's what it's like dry um, so in the Midwest they will actually dry it out um, but here when you're getting a microbrewery they're not drying it out you're getting it wet so spent grain when wet usually it's around 80 percent water so then that dilutes that 29 percent crude protein down to somewhere around like I think 7.9 percent crude now you've completely messed up your feeding program out of an assumption um, and then the other issue with that is it works better as an add-on, which Aaron, I just love you. You're, you're so smart. <laughs> um, but um, it does add as an add-on, but a lot of people are making the mistake of utilizing, utilizing it as a full feed ration. And they're finding out that the carcass quality is not what they thought it was. Because really they're feeding their pig more water than anything else. We'll make our way over to this table right over here. I'm going to show you a, a few quick uh or a few tools that we use here on the farm to kind of track our metrics. Um, and then we will make our way down. We'll, we'll actually see some animals here. Uh, some wheat. I think there's two different types of wheat. There's two different types of oats. There are 
Uh, so forged brassicas in there, two different types of winter peas. So one of the things that we see too is a lot of the um, deer mixes that people will use are really high nutrient levels. And so a lot of the high quality forage mixes that people will use, it's, it's the same thing, yeah. So, so we got kind of a spread of tools that we have that we use here on the farm to track metrics. Um, I'm gonna go over these pretty quick. I won't go into too much detail with them, but they're cool and I just wanted to share them with you. These are things that I really like to, to use here. Um, what, we'll do a transect here on the farm. We do it, we try to do it at, at least quarterly. Um, and so we'll go through and we'll really track what we have going on because those things change throughout the year. So we're looking at anything from uh, insect, beneficial insect species, even pest. Uh, we're looking at plant species. We're just looking, we take a small shovel, we're looking in the soil. We'll take a, a magnifying loop and we'll look at those things. We're sending samples off too. We do two different soil tests here on the farm and this is a soil probe that we have. So we do a Haney test with Ward Laboratories and then we do a conventional soil test. And so what we feel like the difference is, you heard me mention the savings account earlier, that Haney test is kind of telling us what we have there uh, in an organic form, right? So you have inorganic and organic forms. What you have available to unlock with those root exudates, right? So what if you have proper grazing management and all these cool things that I'm, I'm loving to learn about, it tells us what we're able to actually unlock there, the phosphates that are already there, the nitrates that are already there. Um, I haven't experienced this from my farm travels, but I hear some of the what I consider the best farmers in the country talk about how when they've gone out and done a lot of this soil health and a lot of this consultation work that they have not found a single farm. Uh, I think Gabe Brown said that he, there he say, had copious amounts of nitrates and phosphates available in the soil, more than what would be utilized by the farmers probably for the rest of their life. I've heard that from several of these, I call them gurus, I call them really, really smart farmers, what, probably the best term. But this is our soil probe, and, I, and most people probably know how these work. You take a, a core sample, we send it off to a laboratory, and we get some feedback on what's going on in the dirt. Um, I don't have a small shovel up here, but we carry that around on our side-by-side. -side. And so what we try to do is, one of the things that I heard a few months ago is, you know, we're looking all the time, and, I, and I'm very guilty of this, I would walk around and I would see what's going on above the soil. We hardly ever actually look at what's going on below the soil, the amount of life that we have in there. And so I started just doing a few simple things. I'll take this small shovel and I'll just dig up a handful of soil. I'll look and see what my root systems look like. I'll look and see the amount of top topsoil that's on there, how much organic matter I have, how much actual life do I see in that soil, the smell and the aroma of the soil, what's going on beneath the surface. I can see what's going on above the surface through forage and you know, growth rates and everything else and diversity, but seeing what's going on below the surface is actually what we're talking about when we say the things like resiliency and building a drought tolerance and, and so on and so forth. The overall health of essentially everything that we have going is in our soils. So paying attention to those things is why we have some of these tools here and what we're trying to do there. Um, these are some cool tools that we'll use. Um, this is a refractometer and we, these tools right here go together. What we'll do is we'll shear off a few of the different uh, plants that we have out there. We'll put them in these right here. Um, and then it's just a simple garlic press that'll go on a refractometer. We'll squeeze out the sap from the plant and we're able to measure brick percentage off of that. And so that tells us there's a lot of stuff. A lot of people look at it and think with bricks, you're just measuring the, the sugar levels, but there's a lot more to it than that. So there's some studies, if you get interested in that, you can just, why is bricks percentage important, important in, uh, in uh, forages is a good Google. You can get lost on a rabbit hole like I usually do. Um, another tool that we carry around with us is an infrared thermometer. And so that's just seeing what the soil temperature is. Um, I think it's about 110 degrees that we're gonna get at. I don't remember the exact figure, but about 110 degrees, microbes quit functioning, quit cycling. And so if we're over grazing, what we're doing is we're exposing that to the sun. And this is up all the way up into Canada that we're seeing that these temperatures happen. So if we over graze and we expose our soils, the microbes are really what actually keeps our soils healthy. The, their function is, is probably the best thing for the soils, period. And, and the carbon and everything else that's in there, we really start to degrade that once we get too hot. So carrying this around and making sure, hey, did I, as a steward, as a, as, a, as a grazing management, quote unquote expert or whatever we want to call it, any of us here that are farmers, did I do a poor job and expose too much soil? 
right? And so we'll talk about where sometimes we're going to intentionally expose too much soil, but for the, for the day in and day outs of it, that's what we're really trying to track is making sure that as we graze that we're not exposing too much and that we're keeping our soil temps down. Another thing that we can do with this is we can just look at the structure of the soil. Um, I was talking with a gentleman in Iowa and he told me, he said, go buy a couple strainers, get some really good soil that you know is in, that has good health. Um, take that in a side by side with your soil, wet it down, wash it, and then dump it out. If your soil falls apart, then you're gonna know, hey, I don't really have much soil structure there. Um, if it stays together in a nice clump, not like clay wood, but you know, kind of like a nice little ball there, then you should have pretty good soil structure. Um, the other tools that we have, these two are grazing sticks, so they'll help us with um, really kind of determining how much forage we have available in a specific area. Um, this tool and this tool are, are essentially the same, so there's some formulas that go with them. They're just measuring how much, how much forage is out there. You multiply the amount of uh, animals, the weight, how much actual um, stocking density that you have compared to the forage. And the important thing that you wanna do with it is, we're not gonna go out and look at it and say, this is how much, if we have 14 inches of a cool season perennial out there, we're not gonna say, well, this is how much we have. We're gonna look, we don't wanna over, we're overgrazing that if we're down below about five inches or so. So that's what we're gonna figure out is, what's the difference between what we have and down to the desired residue, so. And then we have a moisture probe that we use, just probing to see how much moisture we have in the soil. And then we have a couple of, these are infiltration, rainwater infiltration rings. So the formula that you have with this, you can see how long it takes for an inch of rainwater to infiltrate into your soils. Um, it's pretty sad, the statistics of what it actually is on most farmland throughout the US, the, the infiltration rate. Um, the important thing that kind of goes along with this, uh, you heard me say earlier, we have infiltration, but we also have retention. So one of my favorite sayings in farming is it doesn't matter how much rainwater actually falls on your farm, it's how much can infiltrate into your soils. And then beyond that, how much can actually be retained and utilized by the plants that are there. Oh, and the most important thing, this is actually the test kilovolts. So it tells us whether or not, you know, the fence is on and if it's, if it's hot enough. Grazing management is strategically placing air, uh, animals on a certain amount of area with a certain amount of forage for a certain amount of time in certain conditions as well, right? So we like to do what we call adaptive grazing. We don't have a calendar that says that, hey, this is how long we're gonna keep them here and we're gonna rotate them this and in, in, in this amount of time and so on and so forth. We look at the particular paddock that we're gonna put them in. We look at the weather conditions. If we have, if I put on my calendar that I'm gonna move these animals these days and we get, you know, a, a two week spell with no rainwater and then we get two inches in one day, well that changes around what we're gonna do in, the, in, that, in that amount of time. So we're very adaptive with it. We just look at the animals. We look at the area that we're in. We know what our target goal is for that specific area and we move them accordingly. So, but this is how we contain a lot of the animals. We contain our cattle and all of our hogs uh, with the exception of one of our boars named Bert with this right here. Bert's just pretty stu stubborn and uh, takes a little bit more uh, influencing to stay in. So we'll keep walking, we'll go and check out some of the cattle. We talk about the amount of cattle that we have. So what we have on this farm, we have a much lower stocking density at the time on this farm because it was conventionally grazed and we, we wanted to let this land rest. So we've brought fewer head of cattle, we try to graze them more intentionally. What we do, we have a couple of different things. We have some lease land that we have our cow calf herd on. And so that's in a neighboring property that, that we lease. We keep all of our brood cows, the bull that we lease. Actually, I think everybody went to Bellflower Farm before that. Yeah, we're leasing a bull from them. So you saw those pretty cattle. So man, they look great, don't they? He's got some nice cattle over there. We're leasing a bull from them. They're great for uh, Southeastern um, production. So uh, that's how they got their name with the South Pole. So we run Red Angus. Um, we have a Hereford cow, but that's it. So we have Black Angus or Red Angus is what we have. We strive, we don't have any third party certifications at this point. We say that we like to be 100% organic, we're hope, or excuse me, 100% transparent, excuse me, not organic, 100% transparent. When that, when that comes out, we'll sign up for that. We'll be the first one in line. Um, and so to keep up with our beef, what we have is, with our mission that we talk about, is we do have fellow producers that raise under a really strenuous protocol that we have. And so that helps us keep up with supply and the other thing that that does is that helps those farmers who are doing things the same way. They may not want to interact with the public. They may not want to, 
you know, worry about marketing or branding or any of those things. And so it allows that farmer, I don't want to be the farmer that tells another farmer, hey, if you're not willing to interact with a chef or a retail consumer or worry about building a brand or do the marketing aspect, good luck. The problem with that is, is they cannot extract the added value that they have by not implanting uh, you know, horm hormones or subtherapeutic antibiotics or grazing, or excuse me, force feeding grain or any of those things. You can't extract that out on a commodity market. If you take those animals, the most uh, common way is to sell those uh, at a local cell barn. And when you're doing that, people don't care if it's grass fed. They don't care if it did or did not receive uh, subtherapeutic antibiotics. They do not care if it received hormone implants. And because of that, the farmer does not have the performance on that animal to be able to extract those things back out, right? So we offer them a brand that they can pay attention to what's best for the animal, what's best for the human health, what's best for their community, and what's best for the land, and offer them a way to extract that added value out of their stuff. This is a group of finished animals that we have. We like to have full control on this farm of what we're finishing. So we have a larger area when you get with our mature cattle, they're kind of maintaining is what they're doing, right? Uh, these steers are still growing. And what we're trying to do to give, give folks a high quality product is we put them on a high, high quality annual forage. Um, and so you can see this field that we planted back there. A lot of the things that are really beneficial is cover crops. What those things are as well beneficial for is beef quality. And so they're high in energy, they're high in nutrients. And so it gives us a nutritious product, but it also gives us a well marbled, well textured product that gives us good taste and flavor. Uh, so that's one of the things that we like to have control over here. And again, the animal, animal impact is one of the most important things for soil health. So by doing that, we're grazing. That's the animal impact that we have on our soils is through our cattle, right? So if you have animals that have, have been genetically selected for generations on a high grain diet or high input diet, that animal is not necessarily going to perform as well on a grass diet. So for our program, what we do is we try to utilize modern technology in the form of like carcass ultrasounds and real good genetic selection with EPDs. Um, with our breeding program, we use an AI program along with our bull. And so what that does is we really select genetics, not only that are paying attention to a grass-based diet, but a grass-based diet that we're gonna be able to offer here as well. Because Forages throughout the United States, there's such a variance. And if you look at the Southeast and the Southwestern United States, there's a huge variance there in the, in the forages that are available. So what we try to do is pay attention to something that is gonna be able to perform on the forages that we're gonna have available for them and forages themselves and not, not a, uh, a high supplementation diet. We try to work with a little bit smaller framed animal. Um, there's a low line animal, which are, is almost miniature. We're not going that small, but what we're paying attention to is a little bit smaller frame. The industry's really pushed for a larger frame animal. We like a mid to, a mid to small frame because what that does is an animal is gonna utilize protein in its diet till it reaches a certain percentage of its mature frame size. Uh, and then it's gonna start utilizing energy out of its diet to really add on fat and the intramuscular fat and the marbling that's desirable for a consumer. The smaller frame size means that the younger the animal is gonna be when it starts to actually utilize the energy out of the diet more to add on the intramuscular fats and the desirable beef qualities that we're after. So that's what a smaller frame animal does. Also for the economics too, um, all of beef processing, when we're dealing with smaller processors like, like any farmer like us that's direct marketing to a consumer is doing, you're paying for everything based off of what's called hot carcass weight or hanging weight. And so, if we take a smaller bone structure off the frame size of the animal, well, that's less money that we pay for the same amount of beef in return. And so that's another reason financially that we are more attracted to a mid-frame animal. And you can see these guys are ready to go. Burton's just standing over there, hat and call them. They see them. Depending on the current circumstances, you know, right now we're moving animals about once a day. Back in, I guess, uh, mid-August to September, we were grazing these guys. We were moving them up to three times a day, depending on where they were at. Just putting them on an area. And again, that's kind of going along with the weed control. They're pretty, they're used to it. Yeah, they know they get some good goodies once they go on the other side of the fence, so.
so they'll graze this down. We'll leave them in. Thank you, sir. They'll eat all this. They'll graze this down. Yeah, yeah. And what we'll do is we'll actually come through um, and we will no-till drill into this, the cool season. So this is still a warm season mix that we had. The mix that we the mix that we had, there's there's Sudan grass, there's sorghum Sudan grass, okay. there's some clovers, there's cow peas, there's a daikon radish, I think there's some purple top turnips. The more that I learn about it, I feel like the more the better. Um, these guys that I, that I have a lot of respect for, the men and women that I feel like are really pioneering the soil movements across the country, that's what they're saying is they're, they're just putting so many different things in there. They call them a cover crop cocktails. And so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to see. Oh, they'll, they'll eat this like candy. One of the interesting things too that you'll see is um, when we look at bricks percentage with, with the refractometer that we use, so that'll actually change throughout the day. It'll go down in the root system at night and then come back out. So around this time of day, it's actually the highest amount. So um, it's the best time. A lot of studies will show that this is the best time to move your cattle and this is the best time to cut hay because you'll actually ca capture a lot of that in the plant itself and not so much in the root system. So let's go take a quick peek. There's not too much more to see on the cover crop other than the cover crop itself, but I'm excited about it and want to show it to you guys. So we're standing here with a couple of our mama pigs. These are sows. So these are both purebred Berkshire sows. Um, we primarily run Berkshire here on the farm, but we do cross them. Uh, we have just a pretty relaxed rule of thumb with if it's a purebred Burke, we breed it to a cross, um, whether that be a boar or a sow. Um, we have some that just perform really well and they both may be crossed and they both may be Burke, so we do it that way. Um, yeah, this is a containment method that we have with them. We outdoor, we farrow outdoors year round right now. Um, we're working on potentially move into some more permanent facilities, but that's, you know, that's, we're idealistic about those things at this point. Um, so what we do is we used to use this pig quick fence. Uh, it's a premier one product. We used to use that to contain all of our stalker animals all the time. The reason that I'm not crazy about it is because if one animal decides to go through it, we, we noticed once the, once the gilts got to a point where they would start to come into heat and would get bothered, they would go through the fence. And where, if we have the poly braid like we were showing up there with the other tools you know an animal's not going to rip an entire fence down with this these sections are about 100 foot so they would rip down if they go to pull through it this netting just pops off the post and you'd have 100 foot of fence laying on the ground and then no matter how many pigs you have in there if you take 100 foot of the fence out they're probably all going to come out so we decided that it wasn't the best for our program so what we've done is we still use these to farrow in and so it's good containment for the sows but it also is it's low enough that it helps to contain the piglets and introduce them to electric fencing at an early age. Um, we give them their shade um, in this uh, farrowing hut and so it just provides them with shade. We don't have any bumper guards or anything. In our systems we have pretty high standards with our sows because we want to farrow outdoors. We don't use any any crates um, and so what that means is the moms have to perform um, and be very mindful of their piglets. So. You have a higher mortality rate when you don't have crates, but I feel like it's, in my opinion, I don't think it's humane at all for the sow. And so we would rather have a more humane system for the sow and have a higher mortality rate through crushing with piglets. We find that out the hard way occasionally with gilts. They don't know any better and sometimes they may cr crush over half of a litter. Um, but that's where us having a very high level of selection and high standards and sticking to those standards comes in, in, into being so important. So what it does is it allows us to uh, select moms that are protective, but also docile enough that we can handle the piglets uh, and get in there with the mom and you know, do our thing, feeding, checking on them, fixing fences or whatever it may be. But also, you know, we're out essentially, you take the people away from here and a couple of animals, I mean, there's, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's a lot of potential predator issues that we need that mom to protect against. And so we want a mom that is gonna be aware of her piglet safety and protect them from you know, whether it be a coyote or uh, dogs or anything like that. These are both what we call lactating sows. You know, they've, they've had a litter, so uh, they receive a different ration than the gestating sows that we have. It's a little bit higher protein and the feedstuffs help to promote milk production in their diet. Um, so we feed them the lactation feed, whereas if they were in gestation or after we had weaned the piglets from them and exposed them to a boar, we would feed them a gestation uh, feed. So uh, we pretty much give them feed ad lib at this point um, to help maintain body condition score, which is important for them, for their health. 
and also for rebreeding purposes. Um, and then it's also allows them to produce more milk and higher quality milk, nutrient dense for the piglets themselves. And it doesn't take very long for the piglets with being in there with mama to figure out, this is feed, I can eat this, it's good. And so they'll start to consume a lot of that too. So whereas they're getting ad lib feed, the gestating sows or a boar is gonna get a set amount of feed every day. We'll make our way around. We've got another group here. We got a couple of gestating sows and a boar, and then we've got a group of our large stalkers that we have separated off in the woods too. So what we do is we flush with feed. We try to flush embryos. And so we give them, a, we keep them on the same amount of feed that they have, making sure that they're in body condition score. If they're in appropriate body condition score, we just get them back there and let them as they, after they're weaned, let them come into that natural cycling within the next few days and try to get them bred back. If they're not in good body condition score, we have one that had 13 piglets that we weaned off of her. She's pulled down a little bit. She's had, we've been giving her a, you know, a lot of feed. We weaned a little bit early with her and we're just allowing her to get back to a healthy BCS for our system before we'll expose her to a boar. So she'll come back in, you know, second, maybe even third cycle, just depending on how she performs without the piglets on her. About 21 days. So yeah, about every three weeks. Um, we're working on a few different things. That, that's a good question and that creates another good question. A lot of people say, how do you know if they're pregnant? So with cattle, you could take cattle and you could catch them up in what's called a squeeze chute. You run them in. Oh yeah, she'll dig to China if we'll oh, let her. Yeah, yeah. Like it. Uh, so you could take and you can actually draw a small blood sample from cattle, send that off to a laboratory and they can tell you based off the hormones in the blood if they're bred or not. With pigs, there's a few different ways to do it. Um, one of the things that we're interested in is an ultrasound. But at this point, what we do is we just witness heat. When they're exposed, we document when heat is observed. And if they're exposed to a boar, then we will assume that in 21 days that she is bred if she does not come back into heat. If in 21 days we see that she's back in heat, we continue that. Spending a lot of time with our animals and you know having an intimate relationship with all of your animals, we name all of our animals, we have that. You know, I mean, that's something that we're observing them closely every single day so we can see these things with them. She will certainly let you know, most likely. Um, especially so if you have a group of gilts that have free choice feed, once they start to cycle, she is, she's already full, she's had feed. So she's gonna come to you and she's gonna, you know, she's not gonna leave you alone is the best way that I'd put it. She's gonna be nosing at you and all that. Um, with the sow set, what we'll do is we'll give them time to eat and then observe that. And so they'll notice, you know, you can see them stand, standing over, they'll be bothering the other sows, nosing on whatever it may be, or they'll be coming up to you. Um, you can also witness by putting some weight on their back too, if they stand there for that. If we go to a pig that's not cycling and you do that, that's gonna be an uncomfortable stance for them. And so they're probably gonna walk away from it. With that, you can put some weight, you know, put hands on their back and see if they stand there for it. And that's what we would call standing heat, which would be time. Um, you really want to catch them a little bit before standing heat before you do that. So at the earliest observance of heat cycling, you would want to put them in with the boar just for that, for the cycling and uh, breeding probabilities at that point. So we have two sows here. One has a group of piglets with her and then the other one only had one piglet. And her question is, will the one piglet need to be socialized uh, with the other group? And so um, they will have, they'll be, pigs can communicate with each other very proficiently. Um, through the fence line, you know, it's just like us. They can communicate with each other. We changed the way that we did it. I feel like it's better than what we used to do in the past for our system where we used to just take any piglets. And when we had one group, because everybody was on the same feed, we would take a small piglet and a small weaned piglet could potentially get put in with a, a harvest sized animal. Um, what we do at this point is we allow them to create their own social groups based off of size. We do it based off of the stage of feed that that animal is gonna be on. So if they require a stage one feed, we're gonna put them all together and then give them an opportunity to socialize with, with one another. And really, just like any other animal, they establish dominance. We let them figure those things out. Who gets to eat first? Who at the free choice feeder? You know, who gets water? Who gets their spot in, in, in the pasture um, before they're put in with a larger group? But uh, typically what we'll do is we'll keep pretty consistent size groups together. Um, so they have the opportunity from the time at least that they're weaned, should they not have a litter mate, to the time that um, throughout their entire life that they'll be with a social group uh, to interact with. So the question was how much the pigs weigh. We don't have a scale here on the farm. That's one of the things that we're looking to get. Um, so the way that we're able to do that is in the past, historically we've taken live weight and compared that to a hot carcass weight. So we get about 81 and a half percent yield 
from live weight to that. So we do we just do the math on that when we get our hours back. Um, the average weight from ones that we took about this size last week would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of 282 pounds, something like that. So pigs are pigs are dense animals. They're really dense animals. And about 280 pounds is what we're after. Um, from what we figure on our, if you if you want to say a sweet spot, um, the amount that we put in for the for whole carcass utilization, um, when you're talking about pork characteristics, um, and you're looking at loin area compared to fat cap area, um, that eye area, you want that to be a certain percentage. Um, you want the intramuscular marbling that you have. You want to have a lot of that, and that takes a little bit of time to put on. So. Once we get much past that, based off the frame size that we have and based off of the diet that we have and the animals, it really gets it to where that's that's more of the sweet spot. So that puts us at a 224 pound yeah, carcass weight there, um, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, but with that being said, we do have, we have accounts that want as big of a pig as we'll take them up to about 300 pounds um, hot carcass weight. And then we have uh, accounts that want 180 pound hot carcass weight pig. And so we, we do our best to be able to meet both of those. This is a group, again, you know, we divide our pigs up. I wanna, I'm wanna i gonna put this feed down. I'm gonna show you guys this really quick. Um, we talked about the feed. Some of you guys were up here to see this. So this is, this is the feed that we make. It's contained in this back here. Um, it's a pretty cool system. It's just got a wheel at the bottom. Pigs are pretty smart. So we can't use this on what we would call a nursery pig or a small pig that was just weaned. But once they get up to about 100 pounds, they're good. There uh, is a wheel in the bottom that they'll just take with their nose and just kind of push. And that just lets out a little bit more feed. So it's great for waste. We can feed a small macaron size feed like this, which is you want a smaller feed with pigs. If we went and looked at the layer feed, it's more of like um, everything's in a, in a much, it goes to a much larger screen. It's about that size there. Where this stuff is about the same diameter, a little bit smaller than probably an ink cartridge. Where chickens will take stuff and it stays in their body for a little bit longer, they can break down those the feed ingredients and actually utilize the nutrients off of that. Pigs, it passes through pretty quick. Pigs are very similar to humans. If you look at it, they're a monogastric animal just like us. We have one stomach, so things can pass through. The smaller, you know, the, the smaller size will um, allow them to utilize those nutrients as it passes through more quickly, right? So it breaks down in their stomach and they can actually utilize the proteins and the energies and everything else. Um, Seeing it up here, it's a little bit harder because this is this is a high use area. Um, this is a high traffic area right here where we're standing. This is where we had a feeder right before we moved it. So what we try to do is our goal with this is um, all of these all these small red oaks here will eventually come out. We'll keep the bigger trees. We're going to convert this to more of a silver pasture. So we move that to an area where we're not going to damage root systems that we're going to keep, such as this larger one over here, that larger one over there. We also have a few specific species that we want to keep no matter what the size is. And that's a sourwood, dogwoods, and our wild persimmons, right? And so primarily for pollinator um, species. So if we were to go further on down into this where there's been a lot of leaf litter, or if we went down here, We've ran pigs on this area. I think this is the third time since we've been on this farm. And we just clear a little bit more every time. We try to put the feeders in similar areas because if we put a feeder here and you have, this is a smaller group, but typically if we're running 80 pigs or something like that, we've got, a, we've got some larger numbers of smaller pigs that are further back on the farm. When those pigs gather around the feeder, it doesn't take them very long at all to have compaction issues, especially once you get um, you know, a lot of moisture in the soil or whatever it may be. You press all that moisture down, you get compaction and it dries and it just stays that way. So we try to put those in the same, same spot, but our goal is to really increase the fertility and organic matter here by letting those pigs chomp down on that leaf litter, let them drop their manure, let them come through. We'll, also, this is bare now, what we'll do is we'll continue to open up the canopy a little bit and we'll spread like an annual ryegrass here. It's a small enough seed that it does well as it's broadcast. I couldn't take my drill in here if I wanted to, um, but I can come through and broadcast a few different things. As long as you can get that sunlight in it and as long as you can get the seed in the soil and good contact where it can establish a root system, what we'll do is we'll again, we'll see some uh, forage that'll come up, we'll get a, a developed root system and we'll see the same benefits in here. That's what we'd see out there. There's a farmer down in Georgia and he talks about anecdotal observational science and he says, hey, 
it wasn't very hard for me to figure out that if I went to the edge of my field and I looked in the woods and I see that it's teeming with life and the soils out here, he calls it dirt. At the time, he said the dirt out here that was a dead mineral medium, it was ruined. And what's the difference? I, the farmer, did not go into the woods and mess all that up. Nature was able to take care of it and it did what it was gonna do. Leaf litter added organic uh, matter every year. You had cycling through, uh, you know, insects and, and the microbes in the soil and so on and so forth. Whereas he was, you know, applying all sorts of different chemicals and, and herbicide, whatever it may be, onto that out there and killing all the life that he had, right? If we could take the healthy soils in the forest and we can look out there in the pasture and we can try to manage it the same way and have that healthy ecosystem, then that's what we're after. Um, again, that's why we're gonna run pigs in the forest where we're trying to eradicate some of this underbrush and open up this canopy and not necessarily out in the field as much as we would cattle. They would just be, there's, there's too much environmental impact from the hogs compared to the cattle, right? And that's the thing, just like we talked about feeding the pig slop, uh, man, you, you put a ring in their nose, um, go all the way to the edge and put barbed wire in the ground. I had a guy told me to cut the nose off, the tip of the nose off with a pocket knife to keep them from rooting. Aaron is not gonna raise pigs if I'm gonna have to even consider doing any of those things. My pigs will wallow, my pigs will root, my pigs will be able to roam freely. I feel like my responsibility to be a good steward in our systems is to put them in a spot on our land that actually will help achieve our goals by allowing them to do what they're naturally designed to do. That's why our pigs are gonna be in here because they can root some of these small saplings and all this other stuff out. You know, we're, we're not gonna have to worry about that. We put them out here and they root up all the fescue and clover and everything else, we're gonna get into some problems. So we let them do what they're designed to do in our system in a place that's gonna be beneficial for us and them both. Man, it's one of the coolest things seeing the cows in the woods like this actually grazing. So it's a little more open back there. Um, we, we did a lot of mechanical clearing um, with chainsaws and stuff, but we also, I've got a good friend who has a forestry mulcher that will come in and slowly but surely kind of do that. That takes, it's a, it's a great machine. It takes some of the bigger trees and can just grind them into mulch and put it into the soil. So you guys haven't heard me talk enough. <laughs> If anybody would like to stay, we're going to have uh, the Jacktown Ramblers are going to be playing. They're a great bluegrass band out of Merriam, and they're going to be playing up here. We're going to have uh, food and events and a lot, of, a lot of good setup for adults and kids. Um, so if anybody would like to purchase tickets for that, we'd love to have you stay and, and you know, give us your company. Um, we'll also have a setup for you guys to purchase our grass-fed beef, our pasture pork, or our eggs if you guys would like to do that. So, Thank you absolutely everybody for coming.